um, welcome everyone to the um, history workshop uh, seminar. Uh, my name is Dukelo. I'll be chairing um, Tanya's session today. Um, I'm gonna read um, a long biography um, and then I'm gonna give her 20 minutes to make a presentation. <clears throat> And then after that, we'll have um, an opportunity for uh, for engagements, uh, questions, and comments. Um, just know that this session is recorded, um, and the copy will be uploaded um, on the on the YouTube channel of the Vitz History Workshop. Um, so Tanya <coughs> Evans is a is a director of the Center for Applied History in. Um, at um, Macquarie University, I'm hope, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, at, in Sydney, <laughs> Australia, where she teaches uh, in the Department of History and Archaeology. Her books um, include uh, Family History, Historical Consciousness and Citizenship, um, A New Social History, uh, The Price-Winning Fractured Family, Life on the Margins of Colonial New South Wales, <clears throat> Swimming uh, with the split hundred years of uh, spit ma uh, mature swimming club, um, there's quite a lot, uh, as I said, um, and unforgettable objects, um, lone mothers in the 18th century, um, as well as many other general articles and book chapters on family history, public history, and history of the family. Um, she also curates ex, um, exhibitions and works um, as a consultant for television production companies, uh, making historical documentaries. Um, she's currently taking collaborative work with uh, family and local historians on an archaeological and digital history ob object in the Blue Mountains titled History, Heritage and Industrial Change. Um, in the industrialized landscape. Um, over to you, Tanya, um, your 20 minutes starts now. Okay, thank you so much for um, inviting me to talk with you. It's lovely to be here. Um, as I've uh, said to, to your colleagues, um, it's been a long semester and I'm mid-marking and it's the evening for me, but I hope uh, I, uh, uh, I hope that uh, I can stay energetic while talking with you all, and I look forward to hearing from you in a little while. As, um, uh, as has already been said, um, I teach um, in the Department of History and Archaeology at Macquarie University, where I really focus upon um, teaching cultural heritage and public history, and also the history of sport, which is a, a lot of fun. Um, and I direct the Centre for Applied History, which brings together um, colleagues from lots of different departments and schools and across the university from different faculties together working on uh, the ways in which history works in everyday life, both within Australia and also internationally. I trained in Britain as an historian of the family and I moved to Australia back in 2008 and I've long worked on the kind of transnational history of the family from the 18th century through to now. Um, I've become increasingly committed to the democratization of historical knowledge and collaborative research practices, as well as the co-creation of knowledge. And really for the last couple of years or so, I've been charting uh, with my international colleagues um, in the International Federation of Public History and other research networks, the impact of collaborative and community history projects uh, with colleagues around the world. And I'm part of quite a few research networks, mainly based in Britain and Australia, working on um, demystifying um, some research practices that historians use. So in the Historians Collaborate Network um, that uh, was formulated in Britain, I'm working with colleagues there to bring together academic historians uh, with local family and community historians, genealogists um, and creative history practitioners working on break breaking down boundaries between all these different communities of researchers. Uh, and I'm also part of some other research networks that I won't bother speaking with you about uh, right now, because I'm here really to speak about my article um, that I wrote a few years ago um, and to talk about why I'm interested in family history. 
So it's it's through their families, really, that millions of people all over the world first engage with the subject of history, listening to family stories over the years and being told about where they sit in their family trees. Lots and lots of people, if you speak to them about um, family life or about where their love of history began, it's often um, the, the kitchen table that they refer to and their, their, their conversations with older family members, grandparents and others about family history that gets them kind of hooked on the subject. Um, and really for the past, you know, I, I trained as a historian of the family and I've written a couple of books on the history of um, illegitimacy and unwed motherhood in Britain. And I had become increasingly interested in um, the distinctions that archives and glam sector or, uh, um, organizations made between academic historians and uh, family historians. And clearly family, history, family history has become a global phenomenon, a huge market dominated by Ancestry.com and FindMyPast.com and other um, digital providers, but also um, a huge area of entertainment as well. If you think about the phenomenally successful documentary series, um, Who Do You Think You Are? and a host of other sort of kind of spin-offs from that. So this is why I'm so interested in um, family history as um, a phenomenon. So here I am um, a few years ago, um, celebrating the launch of this book, Fractured Families, Life on the Margins of Colonial New South Wales, which is where I really began a lot of my work on um, working with uh, family historians collaboratively. So this was a history of Australia's oldest surviving charity, the Malevolent Society. And what I wanted to do when writing this book was to tell the kind of story of this charity, but in collaboration with uh, contemporary Australian family historians that had worked on piecing together the um, life stories of their ancestors, their poor ancestors who had called upon the Benevolent Society, uh, which was a bit like the 19th century poor law in Australia. Um, they had called on the Benevolent Society for help. And this is where I first began some of this um, collaborative work that I thrive on today, and which, which really formed the basis of this article that you've read. And I'm continuing to analyze the meanings and an impact of family history on ordinary people all over the world. Um, globally, family historians are using the lives of their ancestors to bring the history of ordinary people to our attention and, and really challenging stories about the stability of nuclear family life, gender, class, race, and sexuality. But they're also questioning um, kind of the national stories that have been passed down to them through the education system, um, through kind of authoritative sources in that process. So what they're doing, um, and this is family historians all over the world, um, they're using intimate family histories, the construction and reconstruction of family memories to better understand the history of themselves, their nations and the world. And I think that is phenomenally interesting. And family history is enabling, you know, a huge number of people to think historically and to produce distinctive forms of historical understanding that challenge academic monopoly of knowledge. And family historians, however, are still marginalised by academia, although that is changing in some quarters. And I've, you know, been part of some amazing conferences in the last few weeks, bringing together um, traditional academic researchers working in and with family history as part of their research. And the article that you read, um, How Do Family Historians uh, Work With Memory, became part uh, or became a chapter in uh, my latest book, where well, you can't really see it because of the background there, uh, Family History, Historical Consciousness and Citizenship, which was really a, a kind of history of emotions project. And I wanted in this book, uh, and you can see that in the article, I think, to try and examine the meanings and impact of undertaking family history research in um, Australia, Britain and Canada. Um, uh, you will see the, the method that I use was predominantly interviews, surveys and focus groups and discussions with family historians in workshops around the world. Um, and it, uh, it, it was a really useful method for me. Um, um, I was very interested in examining how family historians use diverse sources in their work to make meaning of the past, inserting their family micro histories into global micro, uh, macro, sorry, that should say macro histories, uh, and using family history to, to humanize the past, to better understand processes like gender and migration. And, and once, you know, family historians uh, were believed to be in search of illustrious and aristocratic ancestors. But my research, as well as that of others, has shown that, you know, family historians are particularly fascinated by the lives of their working class and migrant forebears, and especially women. You know, a lot of women um, who make up most family historians around the world, at least as, as far as I, I can gather, particularly women, 
understand family history as a way to bring to life, uh, to bring to people's attention, the lives of ordinary women in the past. And as a feminist historian, I'm interested especially in how family historians, as I've said, many millions of whom are women, can use family history to trouble the gendered order of history making, as well as our wider knowledge, broader societal knowledge of the history of the family and social history. So what's interesting to me is that the construction of a family tree can really tear apart people's understandings of what is a normal family, which is something that lots of people are still invested in for some bizarre reason. Um, and of course, my work is all about troubling um, people's understandings of what is a normal family. Um, and it's clear also that feminist historians and historians of women in Australia and elsewhere have long recognised the radical possibilities of family history, understanding how important family history is um, for making people much more aware of the invisible labour of women in the past as mothers and as wives. And it's little wonder that, um, you know, uh, historians of women and feminist historians uh, were first to embrace some of the positive impact of engaging with family historians and have done so for some time now. Um, and, you know, I think this is part of a kind of long genealogy of people recognizing why um, the history of women has been marginalized really since the um, formalization of the history discipline um, in, the, in the late 19th century. Um, it's clear that um, uh, women's historians, local and community historians have always been marginalized by those in the academy, um, um, but nonetheless continuing to make really significant contributions to um, family and local history. Um, and continuously really since that 19th century um, denigrated for their efforts. And I think it's, it's really um, gratifying to see how some of those forms of history, those sub-disciplines are now being um, re-evaluated uh, as a result of some of this work. Um, and it's interesting also, you know, uh, the academic disdain for genealogists remains quite hard to document, uh, something that I come across in when my, my work is sent off for review on occasion, because it's usually articulated orally and rarely in writing. So it's hard to pinpoint that evidence. But, you know, I can speak to many moments when people have derided um, the work of genealogists in lots of different national contexts. So, um, as I said, my book was a history of emotions project, and I was interested in looking at the ways in which family historians are often motivated to undertake research by their effective ties to female ancestors. So feminism often informed their work and they were using family history to learn about women's history and producing new knowledge about mothering and women's diverse roles in the past, urging them to challenge the gendered expectations of women's labor in the present as well as the future. Um, Many family historians, many of them women, begin to produce their family histories because they owe their female ancestors the benefit of their research skills, historical knowledge, and the time it takes to reveal their life stories. Um, and there's a real pride in their research skills um, and the joys of collaboration. And one of the things I look at in the book and not in this article, so forgive me for, for going off on a little bit of a tangent, but something that really fascinates me is how family history is often um, understood as a sort of legacy project for family historians. Um, and psychologists have examined the really positive impact that individuals gain from crafting a legacy to leave for the generations that follow them. So, you know, undertaking family history research, thinking about particular outputs and outcomes as a result of that research can have really positive um, uh, mental health impacts for individuals undertaking family history, but also have important benefits for families and for communities more broadly. Um, as people age, um, uh, they become increasingly concerned about the knowledge and skills that will follow them and how people might remember them once they're gone. Um, and this process involves thinking about beyond the self and one's impact on the world around them. And, and family history is one uh, route uh, people follow um, to thinking about and formulating their legacy. And one of the things that's really excited me in the last little while is how people are engaging with creative responses uh, when thinking about legacy and the forms that memories might take. Um, and um, increasingly in my collaborations with family historians, I've encouraged them, and this is in workshops, I, I often undertake um, collaborative um, and interactive workshops with family historians locally in Sydney, across New South Wales regionally and um, Australia more broadly, 
working with family historians to encourage them not just to undertake research on their family trees and to kind of keep it um, hidden away in boxes in their attics or garage, but to think about, like scholars do, what they can do with that knowledge, what they can do with that research. So getting them, to, encouraging them to think about outputs and, uh, and, think, and creative outputs that they might uh, think about producing as a result of their research. Um, what's exciting to me that it's really due to the diligence and detective work of an army of family historians working globally and often collaboratively that we can learn about their ancestors. Um, family history is, is a subject that many people are hugely passionate about and I think we need to kind of capture that, that passion and to allow them, allow people to disseminate that passion and uh, to encourage others to engage in similar pursuits. And my book argues that, you know, the work of family historians requires really thoughtful analysis, some celebration, some critique as well, but also some celebration and to be offered up as an example to others. And academic historians need to think much more creatively about bringing family historians work with memory into the centre of our scholarly and political endeavours because of its individual and social benefits. Because if historians can understand and explain people's effective engagements with the past, which is something that, that family historians think about quite often, not family historians, public historians think about often, we will be much better placed to impart the social value uh, and the political value of historical knowledge for everyone. And this is really crucial um, because we live in a moment, we've just had a change of government, so we're slightly more optimistic here in Australia. But for a long time, we were being really battered by um, the Liberal Conservative government. Um, the arts and humanities were really embattled. Uh, we have had much funding stripped from us, from universities and from research, from the funding of research, and much critique about um, the work being undertaken in our ivory towers and um, our incapacity to produce what they called job-ready graduates. I, th I think it's really, really important for public historians, all historians, to work much harder at communicating the value of historical knowledge for people as individuals, um, for families, for communities, for nations and for the world. And this is crucial at this contemporary moment. Um, and this is why um, I wrote that article about uh, uh, how family historians work with memory and why I continue to work with family historians um, in my current work in the Blue Mountains um, in, in New South Wales, where I'm, which is a local family and community history project, and why I'm working with family historians in other areas as well. Um, and I'm very happy to talk about that work with you um, uh, for, my, for me this evening and for you, um, I think, uh, your late morning. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tanya. Um, uh, with your fascinating uh, presentation um, and thanks for keeping time. Um, I know it's, uh, it's, it's morning for us, but it's, uh, it's evening for you. Um, so we'll take um, questions and answers um, and, and comments. Um, colleagues can also use the, uh, the chat facility and I'm happy to, to read that. Um, so I see Cynthia's hand is up, um, if anyone else. Okay, maybe let's just start with uh, Cynthia, go for it. Thank you. I'm just putting my video on so you can see me. <laughs> Always um, much nicer. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, that was really good. I, I very much enjoyed your paper and your arguments about the importance of family history and of public forms of history in general. I've been doing a lot of that recently, whether it's in educational fields or I've been helping the city of Cape Town with an exhibition. And it's very discouraging sometimes because you come up against that uh, feeling that opposition to history is necessarily going to be boring. So let's not even engage. <laughs> so, and you know, also your other arguments about how doing family history disrupts normative ideas of the family and so on. I just wanted to ask you if you could talk a bit further about something that you did pay attention to in your paper, but only in a sentence or two, you know, which is something that I think is similar, uh, but, but comparable between South Africa and Australia, which is, you know, the question of being a white 
um, it was in into white settlers, basically, <laughs> and which means that you're going to come up against sometimes against uncomfortable histories in your past. And I've been in Australia recently, and I went to the Barracks Museum in Sydney, and I was very impressed by the way they dealt with those kinds of issues. So they ended up giving you a really sympathetic portrayal and a feeling for the convicts and, and their suffering. But at the same time, I felt dealt with their encounters with Aboriginal people and some of the brutality of those encounters very well indeed. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, th thank you so much for your question, Cynthia. And um, yeah, again, it'd be great if more people um, recorded some of that disdain as well, uh, because it mm -hmm. helps kind of, I think, break down some of those uh, questions and assumptions. Um, yeah, look, there's been some amazing work on, I guess, complicated settler family histories in the last little while. Um, some fantastic public history projects uh, around colonial massacres, which have brought public attention. And it was, a, it was a collaboration with the Guardian newspaper and the University of Newcastle. I don't know if you're aware of it, Cynthia, but seek it out. So the Colonial Front Frontiers Massacre website, it's an incredible digital public history project um, that got Australian Research Council funding. And then the Guardian helped to disseminate it. The Guardian newspaper helped disseminate it. And what they did was bring together um, extraordinary um, interweaved um, white settler colonial histories with Aboriginal family histories as well, and a kind of, I guess, a reconciliation in the present. So families who had no understanding of their really brutal settler, um, white settler colonial past, but wanted to make amends. And not, you know, I'm, I'm uh, you know, we, back in Australia, before I arrived in Australia, there had been the kind of history wars around the, these questions. And I would say in recent years, but very recent years, there have been, there's been some fantastic work um, allowing people to better understand a kind of rapprochement between these two and uh, these two sides, better understand and a better documentation, right? A better histories being produced of that. Um, whereas before, I think it was a bit like convict um, heritage. It sort of swept under the carpet. Um, so those kind of, and again, actually a lot of work on family history. I've got a wonderful colleague, um, Ashley Barnwell at the University of Melbourne, who is a sociologist working on lots of these issues. You might want to read, um, follow up some of her work as well. She's a collaborator in that Inheriting the Family Network, but she's done a lot of work um, around questions, um, these kind of complicated questions. Um, and really people don't sweep these, these histories under the carpet anymore. Uh, they're not comfortable histories, but and this is something that comes up in my work too. People are comfortable with uncomfortable histories, you know, whereas before we would say um, they were not comfortable and they would be swept under the carpet. Look, that's not to say, and Ashley, like me, is really interested in issues around shame. Um, I've, I've worked, you know, I've written a lot of books on the history of illegitimacy, for example, and that's, you know, one obvious thing. You know, there's, there's almost no family without um, <laughs> uh, illegitimacy in their past. Um, and people have got much more comfortable with, with stories of illegitimacy, like they have with convict ancestry, like they have with mixed race ancestry, if, 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 if that's how we term. Um, but what some people are not comfortable with, I've kind of gone off on a tangent here, is um, the discovery of mental health issues within families. So this is one of those questions that people, you know, are continue to be discomforted by. Uh, and I think as historians, we need to look at why that has changed over time. Um, and how undertaking research allows people to better understand um, those issues. You know, I wrote a piece a while ago on the history of domestic violence where people were discovering domestic violence. Again, you know, these stories are ten a penny in colonial Australia as they would be anywhere, right? And it's really interesting how people discovering those stories in the present probably as a result of very public um, prominent uh, debate around domestic violence they are then kind of coming to these subjects and going into their family history research and better understanding them in the present. So I think it's an exciting moment. And sorry, I went on for lots of tangents there, so I apologise. <laughs> no, no worries. Um, uh, it, I, there's still more time for questions. Um, um, thank you for that, uh, Tanya. Um, I I'm, unfortunately I didn't get time to read your paper, um, okay. but it, no it's problem. really it's really fascinating. Um, uh, anyone? 
it's family history a phenomenon in South Africa because I mean I'm not asking I'm new, asking everybody in the room behind their little screens that I can't see um I because people often talk about how well it's it, it seems obvious to me I've looked at Canada and Australia that family history is particularly popular in settler colonial nations um so this is about um people so people argue that it's something about kind of tracing migrant journeys it might be about searching for roots if those roots are understood to be shallow. It might be because there are these kind of complicated paths um, between, you know, different types of settlers or um, First Nations peoples, for example. Um, it looks like Cynthia's got an answer to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, go, go for it, Cynthia. I don't have an answer to that, but I think um, it's very interesting to think about people who are not white. And, um, in South Africa, because uh, I've just published a book with some other people, an, an edited collection of essays uh, that's called um, Archives of Times Past. And it looks at trying to find out how do we know about the past um, before the establishment of colonial control? What sources do we turn to? And we actually, in the beginning of our book, we look at a story told by a woman who's a a well-known historian in South Africa, Nomalanga Mkise, and she is reminiscing about the stories that her father told her when he came to fetch her from her boarding school, a plush boarding school in Cape Town, I think, and drove her to Mpumalanga to, for her holiday. And it, that is a kind, that is a family history, and it's a wonderful story because she realizes that at one point her father talks about one of their ancestors, and in her child's mind, she thinks of this ancestor as having been one of Shaka's friends. And you know, that is not actually far from the truth, because this person was a regent <laughs> acting in the Zulu Kingdom, and so you could cast him as Shaka's friend. And that, and she describes the way that that made her feel proud. And you know, after. She compares it with the kind of history that she learns at school, which is not about, which she can't find any place in, you know. Um, and so what the revelation that is to her, and she eventually becomes a professional historian. So there are lots of stories like that, I'm sure. And there's a lot of stuff on the internet. I mean, my um, people who speak African languages would be able to tell you much more, but there's a form apparently called Isitakazelo, which is um, they're their clan stories and so on, and people looking to find out who belongs to their clan and so on. So there's a, a huge efflorescence of that in South yeah. Africa. Well, see, for um, I'm more comfortable with the uncomfortable. Um, okay. oh, yeah. Um, can, I read, um, jo can I read Njogu's uh, uh, question uh, and then you can go uh, maybe sort of uh, answer both. Um, so Njogu says, I'm curious about your statement that people have become more comfortable with the uncomfortable about the settler colonial past in Australia. Can you say more about how this uh, change has come about? Um, I'm thinking this would also be relevant um, everywhere else, like in South Africa. Well, I think, uh, Nugo, I think it's because it's part of the some of the political work of uh, public historians in, in Australia. As I said, that digital history project that was widely disseminated by the Guardian newspaper. I think also creative engagements with the colonial past have made a big difference. There was a novel written by um, Kate Grenville called The Secret River which told a really brutal history of settlement um, on the Hawkesbury River, which is one of the first areas where white colonials sort of grabbed land, uh, usually from Aboriginal people, and brutalised them in the process. Um, and that novel uh, then became a play, um, then became, you know, it became, a, it, it caught the cultural um, imagination. Um, and so I think that moments like that, I know that there's other examples too, there's other um examples of work by historians um who have written about aboriginal history which has also captured the public imagination one of the joys of australia is that there are lots of prizes for history which it's actually, you know, coming from britain where there are a few prizes there are many more in history so we've had some political leaders who have been really supportive of history um and those prizes play i think a really significant role in um disseminating historical research and really good historical work um, and not just um, scholarly texts um, you know that, that um, digital history project there are prizes for digital history projects creative projects creative media um, and literature and plays and movies and I think these have um, really played a really significant role 
um, in encouraging people to engage with family history. And as I mentioned, that program, Who Do You Think You Are? Um, I, I'm assuming there's a South African version. There's a, there's a version in every other nation, um, well, lots of different nations in the world. And I've written about Who Do You Think You Are? Um, because what that does is um, sort of, sort of popularizes the process of historical research. It dramatizes it and makes it look easy, which of course history historical research isn't as we all know, um, but it does dramatize it and make people aware of how transformative um, undertaking research on your family tree can be. With who do you think you are? It's using celebrities, right? But this sort of, ca again, captures people's imaginations. It's often a political project. So in this country, uh, the programs produced um, by a public broadcaster, SBS, which has uh, a remit to speak to Australia's multicultural past. Um, so it often has an educative um, uh, outcome, which I think is really, really, really important. I, I'm sure that's not always the case when it's produced elsewhere. But that also, you know, that gets, you know, over a million viewers, which in Australia, you know, in a, in a, in a nation with only 20 million people, that's significant. So again, this um, this process has been popularised, or the kind of the idea of under, undertaking family history has been popularised. But also, you know, amongst Aboriginal communities and First Nations peoples, family history is a really important political project um, in uh, a nation where which has been uh, really uh, traumatised by the stolen generations where, where young children were taken away from their families and placed in white families or in institutions. Um, and family history has been used to sort of piece together uh, uh, to reconstitute families that have been split apart, um, usually as a result of state or federal policy, or um, uh, you know these kind of these kind of things. So, so family history is a really important political project. It also is an important political project in terms of native title. So, in terms of uh, allowing you to claim um, a relationship to the land on which you live. Um, and in claiming um, stolen wages as well. So, you know, family history research is a really, really important political project. And again, that has um, really, that has been now, is now supported by the state as well. So th that's my answer to your question there, Nyogu. Thanks, that's very interesting. <laughs> All right, um, we still have a, a, a bit of more time to take more questions, but I'll read, um, Ali's uh, comment in the chat. So he says, um, to take from uh, uh, Cynthia's comment, Feda about is Takazelo. It's interesting how families, cl clans, uh, establishing establishing uh, family foundations and self-publishing. Um, it's an uh, area that will be interesting to study as they also draw on colonial text, particularly about migration from uh, East Africa to Southern Africa in ways that the apartheid uh, uh, indigenous road and justified the empty land. So yeah, yeah I don't know. That if sounds that, fascinating. That. Yeah, I, I know nothing about that, but it sounds absolutely fascinating. So is 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 Tagazelo is uh, is basically a a, a praise um, family name. Um, so I would be and Sapo um, and part of is Tagazelo would be to say and that is to trace um you know the family history so that's what yeah ali is saying and he's saying that lots of families are self-publishing um sort of um, books starting foundations to sort of trace um the family history that sounds um, great all right um i do not see any other questions i don't know if you had um, maybe concluding thoughts uh, before we we conclude. No, I would love to learn more about all these things. So please send links along if you have them. But um, no, it's been lovely talking with you. All right. Um, thank you so much, Tanya. Um, and thank you for um, agreeing to do it so late um, uh, for you. It's early for us, um, but we appreciate it. Um, and thank you so much. That brings us to the end of today's webinar. Thank you so much for having me. It's been lovely. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Thanks, Tanya. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Thank you so much.